you to listen for God's word as it comes to us from the hand of Matthew, Matthew's gospel, the sixth chapter, beginning to read at the seventh verse. Listen for God's holy word. When you pray, don't pour out a flood of empty words as the Gentiles do. They think that by saying many words, they'll be heard. Don't be like them because your father knows what you need before you ask. Pray like this, our Father who is in heaven. Amen. Let us pray. Father, I ask that the words that I speak and the meditations of our hearts may be worthy to you as we experience the certain presence of the risen Christ in this place. Amen. Friends, there is a delightful cartoon of a small boy on his knees by his bedside offering his evening prayers. And his tone is one of frustration with God. Dear God, Aunt Stella still isn't married. Uncle Hubert still hasn't got a job. And Daddy's hair is still falling out. I'm growing tired of praying for this family and not seeing any results. And we understand that small boy. I think a good number of us would agree that prayer is important, very important. So why is it that so many of us have difficulty with prayer, or at least regular prayer each day? I believe that the primary reason we have such difficulty with prayer is because we have never grasped the primary purpose of prayer. We have never grasped the primary gift that prayer gives to every one of us. So like the boy in the cartoon, we are frustrated with God. We have reduced our prayer life to asking God for something, and we discover that Aunt Stella still isn't married, and Uncle Hubert still hasn't got a job and daddy is still losing his hair. Perhaps that's why we grow frustrated with prayer, because we have reduced prayer to asking God for something. About a year ago, I received a phone call from a dear friend in the church that I served in Pennsylvania prior to coming here 10 years ago, Bill Kurz. I love that man deeply. And he gave me a phone call, and he said, Doug, you need to come back to Pennsylvania, and as quick as you can, Florida has not been good for you. Whatever do you mean, I asked Bill. He said, I've been watching you every Sunday, every Sunday for nine years, and you're losing your hair, and what's left is turning gray. I suggested to Bill that perhaps that's because I was nine years older than when I was his pastor. We grow frustrated with prayer because we do not understand the primary gift that is ours in prayer. Well, Jesus Christ is standing right here in chapter 6 this morning of Matthew's gospel, and Jesus wants to teach us a school of prayer. And we run to chapter 7. And when we get to chapter 7, we hear Jesus say, Ask, and it shall be given to you. So we ask. And Aunt Stella still isn't married. Uncle Hubert still hasn't got a job, and I'm still losing my hair, and we are frustrated with God. And then Jesus Christ speaks up and says, Chandler, you're over there in chapter 7. I'm not there yet. I'm right here in chapter 6. And if you miss chapter 6, then you have a distorted understanding of prayer, or at least a too narrow understanding of prayer. Whatever are you doing over there in chapter 7 when I'm here in chapter 6? Walk with me back to chapter 6. And listen to Jesus teach his school of prayer. In chapter 6, Jesus says, pray like this. Our Father, who is in heaven. Did you catch what Jesus is saying to us? Jesus does not ask us to pray to God. God is far too impersonal, far too powerful, far too great for our minds to ever grasp or to wrap our minds around. Jesus does not ask us to pray to God. Jesus says, pray like this. Our Father 
who is in heaven. Jesus Christ wants us to focus on a relationship with the Father just as a child focuses on a relationship with his or her own father. How is your relationship with the Father at this moment? Perhaps all of us could use some relationship work. Jesus teaches us to pray like this. Our Father who is in heaven. Some 22 years plus, when I was a pastor in Texas, my son and I were alone in our home and seated on the sofa. Nathaniel asked me, Dad, what do you like best about our house? Well, that's easy, son. And I pointed to the large picture window in our living room. I said, what I like best about our house is that large window that allows in so much natural light into our home. What do you like best about our house, son? And he answered that we all live here together. I was focused on architecture, but Nathaniel was focused on relationships. Jesus is asking that we build a relationship with the Father who is in heaven before we go anywhere else with our prayers. How is your relationship this morning with the Father in heaven? Tucked away in 1 Peter in your New Testament, there is a small teaching but a powerful teaching that tells us that if we do not have a deep and abiding relationship with the Father, we may find our prayers hindered. Have you ever noticed that teaching there in First Peter? That if we do not have a deep and abiding relationship with the Father, we may well find that our prayers have been hindered. We have reduced prayer to asking God for something rather than acknowledging God as our Father and entering deeply into relationship with the Father. I've made it a practice to share a particular story with this congregation at least once every year that I'm your pastor because this story has had such a profound effect and impact upon my own understanding of God as Father. Some of you may remember it. Many of you have not been a part of this church long enough to have heard it the first time, but let me share with you that when I was in graduate studies in Atlanta, Georgia, I was a part of the North Avenue Presbyterian Church there in Atlanta, and I was a part of the singles class as well. I had not yet met my wife. And on this one particular morning, a young man had asked the school teacher, the Sunday school teacher, for permission to address the class, and he did. And he said, some years ago, I fell in love with a young woman, and she's a Christian. She asked me to start going to church with her, and I did. And after going to church for a few months, I came to know Jesus Christ as my own Lord and Savior, and I was baptized. And as sometimes happens in relationships, the relationship simply did not work out, and they separated. And he got busy with his life, and he got busy with his studies, at Georgia Tech and he started going to church less often and then finally he wasn't going to church at all and he wasn't reading his Bible at all and he said to us now I am facing the greatest crisis of my life and I simply do not have the strength to see it through so I turned to my faith and discovered that I had done nothing with my faith. So my faith can do nothing for me. He had neglected a relationship with the Father. And now as he faced the greatest crisis of his life, he had no strength to see it through. When we develop a relationship with the Father in heaven, we discover strength that is beyond our own strength, a power that is greater than our own power, to see our way through the storms of life. How is your relationship with the Father right now? 
Thomas Toole, who has preached from this pulpit a number of times, shared with me that on 9-11, when our nation came under attack from terrorists, he had all the pastors of the Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church put on their robes, and they stepped out into Fifth Avenue so they could pray for and comfort a city that had grown anxious and panicky. All the pastors of the Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church wearing their robes went up and down Fifth Avenue praying for people who were scared. And they prayed well into the night. And then when Thomas Toole returned home, at the front door, his wife greeted him. And he began to cry. And he said to his wife, Suzanne, I'm not strong enough for this. To which Suzanne answered, Oh, sweetheart, your ministry has never been about your strength. God has never expected us to face the crises and the storms of this life with our own strength. It simply isn't sufficient. How is your relationship with the Father? It may be that you're finding your prayers frustrating because you haven't developed a relationship with the Father yet. We rush to chapter 7 where Jesus says, ask and you shall receive. And we pray for Aunt Stella, but Aunt Stella remains single. We pray for Uncle Hubert, and he remains jobless. And we pray for Daddy, and his hair continues to fall out. But we skipped over chapter 6, where we are to pray to God as the Father and to embrace our Father as the Father seeks to embrace us. In the mid-1800s, Dr. Phillips Brooks was known as one of the finest preachers in our nation. But when he was a child in high school, he dreamed of one day being a teacher. He grew up in a Christian home, and he was taught to pray, and he would go to his bed each night, and on his knees he would pray, Oh God, make me a great teacher. He completed high school and then went to college. And when he went to college, as many people who do when they go to college, he started going to church less and less and less. He began to pray less and less and less. But when he did pray, he would say, Oh, God, bless my studies so that I can be a great teacher. He had one single passion in life, and that was to be a teacher. And his major in college was in education. And when he finished college, he was given a job as a teacher in the local public school system. And after one year, he was fired. And the administrator says, Mr. Brooks, you are no teacher. And he faced the first great crisis of his life. And he didn't know what to do. His college education was all about education, teaching, others. That's all he knew. And now he was back home with his mother and father because he had no job. He could not afford his own place. And he began to go to church with his mother and father once again. And he began to pray once again. And he began to read his Bible once again. And being unemployed with a college degree, he began to read the Bible more and more and more, he saturated himself in the word of Almighty God. And he saturated himself in prayer, not just a quick prayer, wanting this or that, but he spent time, hours each day, sitting before the scriptures, seeking to know this God who wrote the Old and the New Testament through the hands of many. Until one day he felt a strange warmth. And he began to cry. And in his own words, he said, for the first time, I felt that God has shown up right here in my bedroom. And I experienced him as a father who was not ignoring my prayers, but someone who loved me deeply. But more profoundly, what he heard is Mr. Brooks 
now that I finally have your attention. I never destined you to be a teacher. I have claimed you to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Phillips Brooks enrolled in theological school. Three years later, he was ordained in the Episcopal Church. After his ordination, every church he served from Philadelphia to Boston was packed to overflowing, becoming known as one of the most persuasive preachers of the gospel in our nation's history. After preaching for some years in Boston and his fame growing throughout our nation and the English-speaking world, he received an invitation from the president of Harvard University to come to his office. Dr. Brooks arrived for the appointment, went into the president's office, the door was shut. Approximately a half an hour later, the door opened again. And Mr. Brooks stepped out of the president's office of Harvard University and according to the executive secretary to the president, all color had left his skin and he was shaking uncontrollably and he left the administration building without speaking a word the secretary went into the president's office and asked what happened mr brooks is pale and shaking and hasn't said a word the president of harvard university said I offered him a teaching position here at the university. Can you imagine? To be a teacher at Harvard. Gold crown of your desire to be an educator. And he turned me down. He said God had him now. That God had his heart and simply would not let his heart go. He said to me, Mr. President, thank you for this high honor, but I don't have a choice. I have been called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I can do nothing else. Mr. Brooks' prayers in the beginning was for something that he desired, to be a teacher. But he made the prayers apart from any significant relationship with the Father. But once he entered into a relationship with the Father, his prayers became changed. Show me what it is that you would have me to do. And then equip me for doing it with uncommon excellence. And so the Father said, Mr. Brooks, I have never destined you to be a teacher. Therefore, that prayer was never answered. I have called you to be a pastor and to be a preacher of the gospel of Christ. And once Mr. Brooks heard that call, he preached until he drew his last breath. How is your relationship with the Father? If you are still praying prayers, asking God for something, you may find that Aunt Stella is still single and Uncle Hubert is still unemployed and I have found that I am still losing hair. But rather than being frustrated with God in a relationship with the Father, I've come to trust that my present and all of my tomorrows are held and the grasp of Almighty God. The greatest gift of prayer is that we get a Father who loves us. May it be so for you and for me. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that we may not neglect what is most important in prayer. And that is simply sitting before the scriptures, the Holy Bible, 
reading and thinking about you as if you were in the room showing these scriptures to us, speaking to us, teaching us, showing your love for us in the person of Jesus Christ. We ask, O oh God, that we may experience you as Father this day and all of our tomorrows. Amen.